behalf of the Battle of Homestead Foundation, we're really happy you could join us for tonight's program, which I'm sure is going to be terrific. I'm Suzanne Donsky. I'm a volunteer with the Battle of Homestead Foundation. And the first thing I'll note is we are recording the program. Um, the second thing is just by way of housekeeping for the Zoom, I'm going to ask that everybody mute themselves and remain muted until um, we can indicate later on if there might be discussion, uh, actually live discussion. Our preference is always, if you can put your questions in the chat, we'll curate them and then ask them of our presenters during a question and answer session um, after the main presentations. I wanted to tell you as well, that uh, we prefer or recommend that you use the speaker view rather than the gallery view. I think it helps with particularly this many people online. Um, it'll help you focus a little bit. And we hope not to have technical difficulties tonight, but let me just say um, we're doing something different here. This is hybrid, uh, and one of our pre presenters, Andy McPhee, the author, is on Zoom, and then, of course, our other folks are actually at the museum. We'll do the best we can. We ask for your patience, and we hope very much that you enjoy the program. I'm going to turn it over now to John Hare, who is the president of the Battle of Homestead Foundation. John? Thank you so much, Suzanne. And I'm doing one of these because it was nip, nip and tuck whether we'd be able to be here or not. But uh, good evening, members and friends and guests. Uh, welcome to the Battle of Homestead Foundation's 2023 program series in partnership tonight with the Donora Smog Museum. Uh, I want to ask everyone to please join me in a brief moment of silence in honor of the passing of Tom Conway president of the United Steelworkers. Mr. Conway died yesterday. He was a staunch and effective fighter and leader for American workers and for a sustainable future for both our communities and state union industrial jobs. Thank you very much. Tonight, we'll again dig deep in the fertile soil of American social and industrial history and spotlight one of the worst environmental disasters in American history. The place is Denora, Pennsylvania, a gritty but burgeoning mill town on the Monongahela River, some 24 miles south as the crow flies, but not that when you're driving, <laughs> from Pittsburgh. The time, the time is October, of 1948, just three years after the end of World War II. Our guides tonight are Mark Powellek and Brian Charlton, the two main organizers and leaders of the Donora History Society and the Donora Smog Museum, where I sit tonight, and also special guest, registered nurse, health education publisher, and author Andy McPhee, whose book, Denora Death Fog, Clean Air, and the Tragedy of a Pennsylvania Mill Town was recently published by University of Pittsburgh Press. He will join us from St. Petersburg, Florida, where he lives with his wife and two dogs. <laughs> I met Mark and Brian last Saturday here in this fascinating storefront, chock full of industrial and social memorabilia, photos, posters, newsprint media, displays, banners, everything you'd want in a museum. The Donora Smog Museum was founded 15 years ago, and we should all honor Mark and Brian for their ongoing labor of love, uncovering, preserving, and interpreting the lives of those who lived, worked, and died here. I think I understand that Brian, a former scout leader, is the museum administrator, business agent, research outreach agent to organizations and program organizer. And Brian, a retired school teacher, is the education presenter, researcher, and archives curator. Did I get it right, guys? Close enough? Okay. 
so tonight, Brian will give us the relevant background about the Noranit history, up to and including the aftermath of October 28, 2048. As the smog disaster commands our attention, Brian will invite Andy to comment and dialogue. Our meeting is planned for about 90 minutes and includes a public Q&A around 8.30, maybe a little later than that. Everybody, please write your questions or comments and post them in the chat. Uh, program chair, uh, Suzanne, our program committee chair, Suzanne Donsky, will chair the Q&A and Mara will curate the questions. Mara Bainbridge, thank you. Uh, my quick take on a drive down the commercial and residential streets of Denora illustrates our nation's long and torturous push and pull between the once vigorous industrial development and community prosperity and the current devastation of industrial deinvestment and community abandonment. It could be Homestead, Rankin, Duquesne, Clareton, the rusting of bulldozed factories and boarded up stores and homes. It's heartbreaking. It makes us ask, what happened? Why? Who are the haves and the have nots? And especially, how are things different today? What's the future for our kids? Let me, let me briefly tell you about the Battle of Homestead Foundation. Our founders were inspired by a dramatic labor conflict, the 1892 Battle of Homestead. The nation's eyes back then, 131 years ago, were on that thriving industrial town 12 miles downriver from Pittsburgh. The strong workers union, the amalgamated, had built powerful alliances within the workforce, including the non-union immigrant laborers, the community and the region. They knew they had to defend their labor contract and its first rate compensation and work standards. Their employer in the modern, most modern steel factory in the world, uh, the Carnegie Steel Company, a monopoly steel cold empire was controlled by Andrew Carnegie and his henchman, Henry Clay Frick, who determined, who, they, who were determined to cut wages and break the union. When the contract expired, Frick built a 12 foot high wall around the mill, locked out the workers and launched plans to import scab labor. The union then called a walkout. An epic struggle ensued, which despite extraordinary resilience and militants by the workers and their allies, which I must say included the mayor of Homestead and the majority of the, the uh, law keepers in, in Homestead, ultimately resulted in defeat for the union. That's because three weeks after the Battle of Homestead, 8,000 state militia were sent by the Pennsylvania governor at the request of Frick and Carnegie to occupy the mill and escort in scab labor. There are many sub stories and revelations within this epic, far too many to relate tonight. The more we dig deeper and learn, we discover and celebrate the seeds of hope in that resilient worker and community struggle. What are seeds of hope? A story or discovery that another outcome, another world is possible. We can make history. The mission of Battle of Homestead is to grow these seeds by promoting a people's history and accounting of how average working people in their communities have experienced, understood, and acted to accomplish their hopes and ambitions. That's also why we work to empower today's workforce and build strategies for a future that benefits all working families in our nation. Our goal is to build a powerful partnership, is to build powerful partnerships to develop a regional center and institute for labor history and the future of work. We do public panels, historic commemorations, lectures, concerts, art exhibits, drama, archives collection, and exhibits. This year, they've been presented mostly online, but no longer, we think. Today, the seeds of hope will sprout anew, even as our country faces major social, economic, and political crisis. The crisis can also mean opportunity. Tonight, we again celebrate people's history. We're optimistic about our mission as we see the growth of power for working women and men and their communities. So we say, come join us. Now, finally, folks, I'm delighted to present 
Brian, Mark, and Andy McPhee, and especially Brian, who's going to guide us here. Okay, thank you, John. Um, uh, this presentation was originally developed uh, from a... Uh, oh, now I've got to find where I can share the screen at. Scroll down the bottom, it'll pop up. Okay. There's screen. Okay, uh, this was th this presentation was developed for a three hour OSHA class, and I was told that we had an hour and a half. In reality, we have less than an hour. Um, and so we hang on, we are going to take a quick ride. Um, uh, some of the associations that we have here in Denora uh, with the Denora Smog Museum. It, uh, are the University of Pennsylvania, California University of Pennsylvania, which is now Penn West, of course, Osher Lifelong Learning Center, or John Hines History Center. All of those things, uh, we've kind of a, uh, allied ourselves with uh, big time heavy hitters, uh, even though the, the people here can attest who are sitting in the audience uh, that we are at a basic grassroots level. We are renting an old storefront that used to house a, a Chinese restaurant. Uh, so we are um, in a um, kind of a unique situation. Uh, I'm going to okay. We can't go forward. I'm going to have to do it that way. Okay. Um, uh, and I'm glad to have Andy McPhee with me. Now I've thought of several different ways of doing this. And Andy, we're just going to go ahead and start and bring you right in, and you can talk a little bit about your book. Uh, and what I want to start with, Andy, is the idea of uh, the beginnings and the founding of Denor, the very very early days. Uh, of Denor, if, if you could give us a little back background on that. Sure. Um, William Donner was a, uh, uh, he was, he was an entrepreneur from the get-go, even growing up. He grew up um, in his father's flour mill in Columbia, Indiana. He got into um, natural gas and but he wanted to get out of that. He could see that there were the deposits of natural gas around uh, appropriately named Gas City were drying up. So he looked to Pennsylvania and he wound up wanting to build uh, and, and building a wire <clears throat> nail plant in Denora, which is on the, uh, as everyone knows, it's on this horseshoe shaped curve in the, the Monongahela. So he built the town from scratch. He bought as many properties as he could. He and uh, he worked primarily with Andrew Mellon and the uh, the plants were built on the land that he bought. Um, everything started in uh, basically 1900 when a gun went off at the land office of the, of what was at that time, the Union Improvement Company, which was the, um, the organization that they used to build the town. And from there, the, Town grew very rapidly. Um, the houses with were put up along with buildings for workers. They scouted buildings as far away as New York. People getting off immigrants getting off the ships to bring them to Denora. Uh, the first mills were the steel and wire mills, uh, the blast furnaces at the south end of town, and those went along very very well. Um, they were making money. By the time the zinc mill um, opened, and I may be getting ahead of us, Brian, let me know, in 1915, Donner was out of the picture. He was in Philadelphia at that time. But his the people he put into place, uh, and certainly Andrew Mellon's company, uh, were, were taking things uh, as far as U.S. Steel wanted them to take them. So the mills okay, blossomed. Little, yeah. And, and again, we've got, we've got keep, we've got to keep rolling. I could, we could sit here, we could yeah. talk for about William H. Don, the beginning of the North uh, from now uh, uh, in, until 11 o'clock tonight, uh, but we're not going to do that. Uh, I will say that Donner came to Denora, as Andy said, in search of natural gas for to fire the furnaces of his mills, but he didn't come to Denora first. He came to the town of Manessa, 
Uh, and he started uh, with uh, the uh, National Tin Plate Company that he started in Manesson. Looking across the river, he sees this, uh, this another opportunity on the floodplain to build a community, and that's going to become Denora. Uh, and uh, of, 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 of course, he gets involved with Andrew Mellon, as you mentioned. And uh, do you want to tell the story? The story of the d name Denora. It's the only Denora town named Denora. is the only Helen town. Yeah, it's the only town named Denora in the world. Um, it's named for uh, Nora Mellon and William Donner. They put those together. And and uh, so it's right. been Denora ever since. I don't know if you can see, uh, we, we're showing a photograph right now of Andrew and Nora on their, their wedding day. The 44-year-old Andrew and the 20-year-old Nora. And here's another story that we could go dive deep into. This relationship is just absolutely fascinating. But again, we're, we are constrained by time. And here we have a photograph of those first lot sales. Uh, we have um, the Union Improvement Company selling those first lots in what is going to very quickly become the industrial uh, community of Denora. Now, the infrastructure of the community at that time was very, very sparse, very, very lacking. Uh, they had made all of the considerations to build a, a wonderful mill and downtown business district, but where were the people going to live? In 1900, as Andy mentioned, we have uh, about 12 people living in the Kastner homestead. By 1901, there are 4,000 people li living here. Now, they're not all staying with the Kastners, obviously. So they put, have to put up these types of housing, this very, very quick instant almost housing that leads itself to a lack of infrastructure. Here we have uh, uh, open sewers and things like that. These, these are photographs taken in the very early days of Sonora, actually in the location where the zinc works is eventually um, going to be built. And Andy talked about the immigrants. Uh, the immigrants are the ones who are building, obviously, this mill, and they are coming mostly single men to stay uh, in multiple uh, in, in, in multiple um, uh, 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 ho housing situations where we have the hot bed method, where people are sh three people are sharing a bed and working shifts, uh, not knowing exactly when they're going to be changing the sheets. But uh, they are going to be in um, uh, polluting very, very early and very, very quickly. They're going to try to build up that riverbank. Uh, the previous photo that we saw, we see the um, the Denora Southern Railroad crews with the slag pots, and they're going to build up that railroad bank, or excuse me, that river bank with slag, and so they're going to start polluting almost instantly from the point from, from the, the moment that they actually get here. Uh, anything about the early infrastructure that we, you would like to say, Andy, or anything else that comes to your mind uh, before we move on? No, go ahead. You're good. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so they're building a modern mill. This is state of the art in 1900. Absolutely the top of the line that you can get. But as you can imagine, in real photography, uh, that isn't going to be very complimentary. We're, we're going to get complimentary. We're going to get these types of photographs where we see, uh, for example, we, we see this uh, postcard that the Library of Congress claims to own, but we own the actual original glass plate negative. So uh, and we're not going to fight the Library of Congress. We're, we're, we're not going to take them to court or anything like that. Uh, but this is the original. And you can see the riverbank is actually relatively shallow in the very early days until they actually start to build it up. Now, I'll give you an overview, uh, because we do want to get to the smog relatively quickly, uh, a kind of an overview of uh, where we're at. This is 1939. And uh, I know that you guys aren't going to be able to see this because I don't have my but anyway, the zinc works, uh, and I'm showing the folks here, uh, is is right about here. And you're going to, this is the whole mill complex. Um, uh, and again, uh, our, our page is kind of um, a little bit um, covered by the uh, photographs there. I don't know if I can get rid of those or not, but. Uh, right, what am I going to do? With the mouse. Oh. oh, okay. This? Oh, great. Oh, thank you. 
Okay, so uh, here, we, he, this is the mill complex that Andy talked about, and it took them a relatively, about 15 years to build. Uh, blast furnaces, open hearth, uh, zinc works, and of course, the acid plant, wire works, nail mill in the middle. Carnegie's vertical integration um, in action. The, the zinc mills, you can see the, the smoke pouring out of the zinc mills uh, across the river to uh, Little Webster. We'll talk more about that, of course. But um, that's what started Webster's uh, decline, that, that smoke, specifically from the zinc mills. I need to bring up myself. That's... Thank you. Oh, you can bring it up again later. Okay. Okay, advance with the keyboard like this. Okay, um, so this is 1967. And you can see, uh, as Andy was pointing out, the erosion that has gone on in, especially in and around the zinc works. By 1985, um, this is what it looks like. By the 1990s, everything is kind of gone down there in the industrial plant. And, uh, but we're going to get back now to the beginning in 1915. They clear the land down by the river. Webster is the little village right across the river uh, from Denora, and it is going to get hammered for the next 50 or so years with the, the toxins from the zinc works. And they put this up relatively quickly, um, They and they start to build. In the background there, you can see the boss's houses. Uh, they had originally built the, the houses for the major department heads in the mill uh, right across from the zinc works. Uh, and they realized very, very quickly that you don't live exactly across the street, directly across the street from a zinc works. Uh, the zinc workers that I've interviewed over the years have stated that they either walk to work in six inches of dust or six inches of mud. There was no vegetation. The vegetation was completely gone in and around the zinc works and especially over on Webster Hill. Uh, this is the superintendent's house. Uh, this, and the, here we have a view of the superintendent's house backyard on their opening day, 1904. And the backyard of the superintendent's house by the time that the zinc works is operating in the 1930s, this is what that looks like. Uh, they have, the superintendent is long gone. <laughs> and this is kind of the, from the Spanish club in, in town. Um, so, uh, as you can see, there's something going on with the zinc works that cause, causes a lot of toxins. And, I, I, and this is one of my favorite photographs. If you see in the foreground there, the kids are playing baseball. We have, uh, and of course, the zinc stacks are spewing uh, quite, quite proliferating uh, a, a, a great amount of smoke uh, out of them. And as you can see, also, everything looks like it's in black and white. Andy, anything you want to jump in on here? Well, like the... Uh... Uh, do you want me to take the trains or the black and white aspect, or what do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, anything. Yeah. So they there were miles and miles of of trains within the mill complex, and this black and white photo. Yes, the black and white photo. But even at the time, things were black and white because there was so much soot. Um, the people would clean their houses every single week, and I mean clean top to bottom, cleaning the the front porches, washing the walls down, cleaning all the linens, all from the soot and uh, particulate matter that's blowing out of these smokestacks you see here. Right. And the method that were used that they, they were using was something called the Belgian type horizontal retort method. Now we have video and I think, have we linked that Mark? Have we, have we linked that video uh, with the, these guys uh, to, to, to allow people to watch that? Not now, but later on they can go to it because we're not going to have time to actually get in, dive into the video. We don't, we, yeah, all of this uh, is on the website. We have a link to the Swansea Vale uh, uh, Zinc Works in Swansea, Wales. Um, uh, and uh, it, it shows you what the, 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 the absolute um, brutality of this type of labor uh, the average age of a zinc worker at their death in Swansea, Wales in the 1950s was about 45 years old. Uh, and as you're going to see late, and of course, this method starts in the 1860s, and it is incredibly toxic and incredibly dangerous environment to work in. Uh, this is the Denora Zinc Works. Uh, this is a zinc worker. As you can see, he's very well equipped with his soft hat. He has no face mask on whatsoever, no, no respirator. Um, he has no eye protection. Uh, he does have gloves. He does have an apron because he's going to tap the retorts. Now, those 
each of those little things that you see coming out of, those are called retorts. And this is all part of what's called a spelter furnace. Now we have some staged photographs. In Denora, uh, there were 10 spelter furnaces and on each side of a spelter furnace, each spelter furnace has two sides. And there are 340, right, 340 retorts on each side of these furnaces. Now I'm not a math major, I'm a history major for a very specific region, reason. And that's because I, I could never have been a math major. Uh, so you guys do the math and I think that adds up to eventually somewhere in the neighborhood of over 6,000 retorts that we're going to be dealing with every day. So this is labor intensive. Each retort has to be tapped individually by an individual person. He has to go to that retort. He has to tap it. He has to take out the zinc, pour it into a ladle, take that ladle, pour it into a mold, and then allow it to hard. And then we eventually get a zinc bar. So uh, th these are, again, all posed photographs, little chaos at the face of this furnace with hundreds, if not thousands of guys working. Uh, in fact, well, this is part of the video that you can look at. We're not going to be able to watch it because we're not going to have the time now. Now, you might ask, what types of safety measures were they using? What, how were they experimenting? And when the United States Steel lawyers were here, uh, I will back up a little bit. When there was a re there is a current remediation suit going on here in Denora right now, and the United States Steel lawyers came here to have some type of discovery, and they saw this and said we should not have this. Uh, this is uh, evidence that they were doing soil and root exper experimentation at the zinc works, under trying to understand what they were doing to the environment. Uh, many years ago, I went to the uh, Chicago, the headquarters of United States Steel, and tried to get into the archives looking at Denora. And they uh, actually told me at the time, they said, um, Denora, did they actually have a mill in Denora? Is United States Steel? So they have denied any existence that they had, were in, in any involvement whatsoever. Uh, and Andy, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, and then you can address it as well. Um, the zinc shakes or the zinc jitters. This is the, these were the symptoms of just about everyone in town during the smog disaster. But this was something very common in the mill that these guys would experience. One of the things is that you have to remember is zinc workers work three hours a day. You can't stay in that environment for more than three or four hours, or you're, you're, you're just going to drop. Uh, but they would experience this, the lightheadedness, the dizziness. This is, these, are all the, the, um, the, the, these are all the effects of what's happening when you're absorbing all of these toxins in a very concentrated way, which is what the community was doing back in 1948. So the guys come up with a remedy for the zinc shakes. Uh, you mix water, milk, ice, oatmeal, and whiskey, and you drink it outside in the fresh air. Um, now, you don't um, at a zinc works, when you work at a zinc works, you don't get a break. You come in and you work your three or four hours and you don't have a smoke break. You don't have a coffee break. You don't have a lunch break. Um, you don't have a bathroom break. You are working that entire time because they, you want to get in and out as quickly as possible. But if you start to experience some of these, um, uh, uh symptoms, they would give you this mixture. Now this mixture ha has some validity to it. Uh, the, the water and the ice are cooling you and hydrating you. Uh, the milk and the oatmeal are indeed absorbing toxins. And the whiskey, because, hey, why not? Uh, it'll get these guys to drink it. Absolutely. And then you're going to drink it outside in the fresh air. And do you have anything to add? Because I know your, your, your medical background can tell us a little bit more. Yeah, the health about that, they, they call this a basically a weekend flu because once they are exposed to fresh air, uh, outside the plants and would go home for the weekend, they would begin to feel refreshed. And uh, it's it's all from the effect of zinc oxide and zinc uh, dioxide coming off of these uh, retorts and throughout the, the zinc mill itself, highly, highly toxic um, and uh, not helpful for anyone. The workers were exposed the most, of course, but the families were as well, anyone who lived up that way to the north end of town was exposed to those zinc oxides, um, very damaging. Right. Um, I'm going to 
kind of like take a little time for uh, conceptualizing right now to give you an idea of what the people in the community were thinking. Denora was very proud of its community. There was nothing to be ashamed of in the zinc works uh, and, and in being being a part of a mill town. Uh, people live day to day. This is one of my favorite photographs in the entire uh, collection. Uh, this is just found in basically a, po a Polaroid um, uh, 35 millimeter photograph negative uh, that uh, we developed. If you look in the background there over to Mrs. Pergola's um, right shoulder, you can see the zinc stacks going. And on the back of this photograph was written uh, Easter Sunday, 1939. So here it is, Easter Sunday, they are in their finest Easter dress, be, either before or after going to church, and they are posing, and the Zinc Works lives in the background. The school building you see, well, you can't really see it. You can see it really well on my computer, but on the screen, it, it's getting kind of washed out as the old Kastner School. So the school children are, are, are living in that environment. And you take pictures of your kids to send off to relatives, uh, and they are in the background. Uh, Beanie, uh, again, here's another character that I could talk the next hour about, uh, just him alone. Uh, it, here he is uh, with one of his horses. His, his granddaughter's here tonight, and I'm sure she could even talk longer on Beanie. <laughs> Beanie was uh, a member of Society for Better Living, and I think Brian will talk about that later on. Right, we're going to get to him. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think Beanie was a member, but I, uh, I, he, he was a, an accountant in the mill. Okay. Uh, he, he work, actually worked for American Steel and Wire, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But this is Webster, the little village of Webster that we talk uh, that that really bore the brunt because the prevailing wind is, of course, going west to east, and Webster is absolutely dead east of the zinc works. And this is a wonderful little village that basically is destroyed. Uh, their way of life, sheep farming, apple orchards, a flour mill, all of that is going to get destroyed by, as you can see, uh, just barely can make out right across the Monongahela River. And if you're from around here, uh, you know the Monongahela River is not all that wide. Uh, those are the acid vats from the acid plant right across the part of Webster. And then the famous Collier's photograph of the zinc works uh, looking from um looking from Webster over to Denor. But, and then again, kids still play. This whole idea of an atmosphere of um, normalcy, uh, whether it be going to the movies or a pickup football game, uh, scouts, whatever, uh, that was part of that lifestyle. Do you have anything to add to conceptualization, Andy? Uh, history from the bottom up, How, Dr. Howard Zinn, one of my uh, mentors and, 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 uh, okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> um, Webster was a, a actually an idyllic place. People would come down from Pittsburgh. This is before the 1915 people would come down from Pittsburgh to spend the weekend there. It was a lovely town, several hotels, restaurants, bars, of course. And, uh, the flour mill was one of the many businesses after the zinc mill came in, all the people who owned, who had any money in town left. And from there, it does just degenerated to basically what you see today. It's a very sad story of a byproduct of a Absolutely. terrible uh, mill. Absolutely. Um, one of the thing, good things that did come out of uh, Webster was the Society for Better Living. Living. Uh, Abe Salapino, a Webster, uh, a, a Webster businessman, Ross Favor Township businessman, uh, started this group in order to get some type of uh, relief uh, in, in terms of uh, lessening the pollution coming out of the zinc works. And here is our good friend Beanie again. And as you can see, uh, I, I think it's because of the lights in here. That's the reason that these are getting so washed out. Uh, he is uh, advertising in a parade in 1951. Now, Beanie worked for United States Steel. He, wore, he was in management. He was an, account, an accountant and he, they, they allow him to do this sort of thing. So it gives you an idea of what United States still thought of the Society for Better Living. And I know that the Society for Better Living is something that researchers have looked at. Andy, have you looked at the Society for Better Living and have come up with, have, have you been able to come up with anything about them? I haven't had a lot. It really happened of uh... Uh, sort of later on, it wasn't something I was going to just get, uh, give. I couldn't give any time to it. I wanted to give a lot of time to so many other topics. This was one of them. I just couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. So much of their stuff is lost. 
uh, and we don't know where the records are or anything, a, 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 anything like that. And now I'm going to allow Andy to take over here because I'm going. I, I am plagiarizing from his book. Uh, I will. I'll, I will be footnoting that uh, because I do give credit where credit is due. <laughs> you don't have to footnote, Brian. This is a, a a map of the victims and where they lived. Uh, nearly all of them died where they lived. There were many uh, comments early on that most of the people who died lived up by the zinc mill, and it's not the case at all. There were comments and that most of the victims were elderly, and that was not the case at all. Milton Hall was 52, which is not elderly at that time. Um, John Forward was 51. He lived way up in the hill, far away, actually, from Denora. So these were people who still life left to go there were a number of uh, elderly ones but this shows you how widely dispersed the uh, the people who died actually were okay so we have finally now made it to october 26 we've laid the foundation uh the thing that the kids when i was in teaching uh would hate uh they, they just want the story don't give us any of the details just, <laughs> just give us the story no no, no we, we don't want any lead up um, so what happens in, uh, in the very early morning hours of October 26th, a, a temperature inversion envelops the, 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 the Monongahela Valley. And simply stated, uh, it's trapping a warm air near the surface, so there's no real uplift in the atmosphere. We don't have any type of way to disperse all of these toxins. Remember, these toxins that in three hours makes the zinc worker uh, start to feel a little bit ill. Uh, now that this is going to go on for several days and begin to build up within the community. And it is it is going to be rife for a disaster that these people are not prepared for in any way. They have no protocols in place. Uh, they are just really literally flying by the seat of their pants. Uh, Andy, do you want to speak to any of this slide? Or do we want yeah, to sure. The, the The lack of wind played a huge role. There had been an enormous area that had no, little to no wind at all. I'm talking all the way up uh, to northern New York, uh, almost completely over Ohio. The whole, most of the whole eastern seaboard didn't have any wind. If there had been some wind, even a breeze, it would have helped. But there was none anywhere, um, and it's not the first time we get te temperature inversions uh, every fall and spring particularly in the Northeast and along rivers. And usually it blows off. This one didn't blow off. There were just the circumstances as such that nothing moved in that valley except the smoke coming out of the stacks, and it just stayed there. Right. Uh, in 2008, we had Stephen Cropper from um, a famous, uh, well-known local weatherman uh, come in, and he uh, we had a, uh, an educational symposium. And uh, he talked about the length that this was the longest lasting temperature inversion of the 20th century that hit that particular weekend. Um, now, the people that I'm interested in in the smog disaster are the are the ground troops, so to speak, the people who had boots on the ground. Uh, Alice Yurinak was a Bell telephone operator. You can hear her story in Rumor of Blue Sky, which is a video uh, that you can find on our website uh, that we did interviews with uh, surv smog survivors. Rosemary Imes was a local pharmacist, unusual to have a woman pharmacist um, at that time. She was one of two or three in her graduating class at Duquesne University. And of course, the firemen who get most of the play, Jim Glaris and Bill Shemp. We have actually Jim Glaris's oxygen tank that he carried in one of our display cases here. And Andy, do you want to talk about Bill or Jim? Or Yeah, or Bill, I'll mention first Rosemary. She sold, uh, she said, she was the first person I interviewed actually for the book. Uh, she she sold a lot of cough syrup during those days and uh, and remembers that very, very well. Bill Shemp um, was one of the firefighters and he, he was emblematic of the type of help that the Denorans all gave wherever they could. Uh, he and Jim and Russell Davis and Jim Volk, the fire chief, went all over town um, to try to save people, give them a little oxygen. So they're the real heroes. Abs a a absolutely, Andy. Um, and you can hear their stories as well in that video rumor 
of blue sky. And uh, uh, there, people ask us, do you have photographs from the smog, yeah. uh, of the smog? And I always warn people, I always say to them, um, okay, it, it, this is 1948. Uh, th they don't have uh, uh, cameras on their phones, but they can just delete photographs. They're actually using film uh, and they can't see anything. So or do you think they're rushing to get their camera to take a picture of something that they can't see? Um, but this is one of the original photographs. This is at the community center. Uh, this is a triage uh, taking place. If you could get to the, Denora has no, no hospital. So if you could get to the community center, they were administering oxygen and it was difficult to get there because there was really a lack of visibility. Uh, Russell Davis, who was of course the, um, uh, the, the official uh, hired driver for the fire department couldn't even take the fire truck out. They were doing all of this on foot, all of the things that they were doing. Um, uh, and ag again, there were no protocols in place. There's no hospital. Uh, doctors are called individually. You called the doctor and he would come to your house. There are 11 doctors in Denora. It's a population of 14,000. And every one of these people is experiencing some level of uh, of effect from the smog disaster. Andy, anything else? Yeah, the uh, the physicians worked uh, the, who were in town at the time worked tirelessly. And they had very, very little to help to give. Uh, they could give an injection of adrenaline. They could give some aminophilin pills uh, that's called theophylline at the time for the most part. And that's about all they could do. Both of those drugs don't last very long, but apparently it was enough to get a great number of people through because only 21 died and an, an unbelievable number considering the, the toxins in the air. Right. And if you could get to the hospital, um, eventually 500 people or more were going to be hospitalized at some point. Uh, the low, closest hospital was Charleroi Manesson Hospital, and certainly they didn't have 500 oxygen tanks, uh, I'm sure. So now we want to get a little bit into the, uh, do you want to, do you want to say anything else about the disaster itself, Andy? We're going to kind of transition now into the, uh, the aftermath of the, of the disaster. Yeah. Just a little bit more in the density of the, of the fog. Um, okay. the, it was uh, Bill Shemp had to cr basically crawl along the street, feeling his way uh, with the curb with the telephone poles with the street lamps to find his way from house to house. And he knew this place up and down like the back of his hand. He'd lived there pretty much all his life. Bill really was, uh, uh, and he was one of the people who were running around. Uh, think of uh, Rudolf Schwerer, who was one of the uh, the main uh, undertaker there, trying to bring bodies back early on. They, they couldn't see the road. They He had his driver walking in front of the car to, on the way to the, pick up a body because he was afraid he was going to drive off the road. It was enormously dense. Um, you couldn't see the other side of the street, literally couldn't see the other side of the street. Um, and uh, that I want to make sure that was very clear. We don't know. You've never been in a fog that bad. I never been in a fog that bad. It was horrendous. Right. That, that, that's, that's the stories. And we have, there are in, in Andy's, not only in Andy's book, but we have dozens of other stories as well uh, that uh, we can talk about different, how different people experience the smog. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, 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 it's absolutely heartbreaking to, to, to hear some of those stories. But in the aftermath of the smog, uh, by November 1st, the smog, the, uh, the front moves through and clean, kind of clears everything out. And in the, in the uh, Denora Herald American on November 2nd, uh, the man on the left there is uh, Mercer Neal, a very beloved man in Denora history. Uh, I've heard very rarely do I ever heard anyone say anything negative about Mercer, even though he did make this particular statement in the paper afterwards. Um, but you have to remember now there is also an attitude on the other side, on the labor side. The labor side, these guys, uh, is comes from Harry Loftus, who is a Denora native. Uh, and uh, the, the idea of these guys storming the beaches of Normandy, what's a little smoke to them? This was very much embraced by labor. We could take whatever that mail could dish out. Very quickly, I'll tell you, when I was working on the Veterans Oral History Project in Ca at California in the, in the late eight, in 
in the early 1990s, um, I was interviewing a lot of guys who were zinc workers. So we would get to talking about the zinc works afterwards, doing a little bit of side research as I was interviewing them for their World War II experiences. And I was interviewing a little old man about 90 years old. He was probably five foot four, couldn't have weighed more than 100 pounds. And I said, who got sick at the zinc works that day and needed to be taken to the hospital? Well, he reared up in his seat. He pointed his finger at me. And he said, not a GD man went down in the zinc works that day. We could take whatever that effing place could dish out. And that was their <laughs> attitude. So that you, you have to incorporate that into why they are eventually going to um, uh, balk at any type of investigation. And I always say that those early investigations, and I don't know if you found this to be true, Andy, the results are going to be a little bit skewed because there was a real lack of cooperation there yes. was absolutely um and even when they had a lot of data they pulled back from issuing any kind of declaration that would in any way suggest that u.s steel was at fault here yeah, when you oh, were absolutely we're going to talk about propaganda in a, in, in, in a minute um, um we're also going to recommend a video that we did with uh california's um uh, digital storytelling program, a uh, poem by the uh, the German poet Günther Kuhnert, who had seen this, this Life magazine article in 1948. He didn't see it until 1950 uh, because he was uh, involved with World War II. His family was in the Holocaust. Uh, the, he had lost half of his family. Uh, Mr. Kuhnert, of course, is a German Jew. And um, I remember that I, on this particular slide, at one point I had writer, poet, activist, and artist. And he heard, he asked us, he threw, threw Manfred Koina, who was a professor of German studies at Penn State, he said, please take activists off of there. There are still people around here that I'm worried about. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, 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 that that is, a, that is a very real thing and very real thing for Mr. Kuhnert. But he wrote this poem in German. Dr. Koina um, uh, translated it into English and a group of young ladies from Cal U. Uh, uh, we're not going to show it. You can find it again on our website. We've got to keep moving. Uh, it's only four minutes long, but it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. Uh, and uh, so these are just photographs of downtown Donora. And we'll get to Dr. Rongus. Dr. Rongus, of course, is the most outspoken doctor. And Andy, I don't know, do you have something you um, are you you have to have something to say about Dr. Rongus? Oh, I could say a lot about Dr. Rongus. He's called Doc Bill. He wore three watches just to give you a quick confession, two on one wrist and one on the other. And the kids love to stop him in town. What time is it, Doc? And he would do both wrists and, and give them an average at the time. Um, he was the youngest physician. And had, I guess you could say, the least to lose. Um, but he was always an underdog. He had a lot of ear infections when he was a kid, and it actually led to a mastectomy. And you can see here his left jaw is a little bit disfigured. But he was outspoken from the beginning. He was telling his patients during the smog, get out of town. If you can't get out of town, at least try to get to the top of the hill in Denor because the smog was lighter there, not as dense as it was at the, at the bottom. And uh, he's the only physician we know of that told his patients that. It doesn't mean that they, the others weren't, but he was very outspoken and was very outspoken afterwards trying to get the mills to take at least some responsibility for all the deaths. And uh, he, he didn't make it. He, didn't, he failed in that regard, but he tried and he helped to bring uh, attention to the situation. Um, actually, just recently, I don't know if you saw these, Andy, I think we got them even after your book came out. His daughter gave us a lot of his letters and papers. Oh, no. Good. Yeah, we, have more, we, we have more primary resources to add um, to, to, to the POW. And I, I include the Mill Hospital there because uh, this is the hospital that is servicing uh, one of the most dangerous industries in the world that is employing 8,000 people. And it looks like it's the twice the size of my garden shed. Mm -hmm. um, so just give you, so there's Dr. Rongus's quote, uh, just get out of town. And of course he was very harsh on the mill. Now, Dr. Clarence Mills, the Kettering Institute in Cincinnati, which is world renowned now, uh, was just getting uh, its, on, uh, its feet uh, or, 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 or get, getting some kind of footing uh, at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, I remember Dr. 
Dr. Mills writing that they had two rooms in a basement in a in a in a building off in a corner somewhere they that, that he had written that he was talking about um uh, uh had the inversion lasted a few more days we would be talking about deaths in hundreds uh if not even maybe a thousand uh and uh, I, i'm going to again add another addendum uh look up philip drinker and mary ann door these are people who are investigating the smog and there is a battle going on here as to who is telling the truth who is is actually doing re solid research search and interpretation uh we really don't have time to dive into them unfortunately today but their story is absolutely uh, fascinating. And some of that uh, propaganda is making its way into things like the paper, uh, the message to our employees and neighbors in Denora. And basically, this is saying that this is an incredible disaster. We are behind you 100%. But in the fine print, if you look there, it is giving a disclaimer. We are in no way responsible for this. Uh, and then, uh, then there is another great piece of propaganda that the United States still ended up ends up putting out. Uh, that again, we have linked on our our website that you need to watch. The language is absolutely incredible. Uh, United States still blames it on basically on unusual atmospheric and uh, topographic conditions uh, that were prevalent in Denor. It doesn't say that anything in the mill actually was the pathogen. And here is what I always. Uh, warn people about whenever they're looking at those early investigations, there is a lot of uncooperation going on. The people know this is a one horse town and the one horse driving this town is the mill. And if you chase the horse away, what's going to happen? Well, the folks who are gonna walk out this door tonight are gonna to walk out there and see what happens when you chase it away. Um, and of course the, uh, the and Andy, I'm gonna bring you in as soon as I say this, uh, the the United States still lawyers talk to the Society for Better Living lawyers, and they say we're going to say this is an act of God, and you guys don't have a chance. Um, so, Andy, what 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 did you learn in any that, of those uh, types of investigations? Yeah, that was the thing. Anyway, there were 106, at least 160 suits filed in the aftermath of Denora, and they were requesting uh, a total of. Uh, Four million six hundred forty-three thousand dollars in in uh, uh, in funds. Yes, um, no, that didn't happen. These the lawyers hit these defendants with so much legal mumbo jumbo, with delays, with in things called interrogatories, where they had to respond and answer dozens and dozens of questions uh, about their property and about their health. And uh, it, they overwhelmed uh, small town lawyers and with only one lawyer against a team, it was overwhelming. And uh, they went really with, it's not our fault. The, the person was sick. We have anything, nothing to do with that. It was an act of God, this thing. We have no control over the weather. And that's a lot of what they went with. And it was just, it was terribly, terribly sad. Um, the most they got about was about total of all those 160 suits, about 5% of the total they asked for. So uh, a pittance. Uh, U.S. Steel could have taken it out of its uh, shirt pocket and given it, given the yeah. money away. That's what I always say, Andy. The settlement uh, is was basically lunch money for United States Steel. Mm -hmm. And yep. Webster, uh, Webster then developed did develop a complex. They did get some things out of the suits. They were able to get a few things, not much. Uh, but the attitude you see, you're entering nowhere, Pennsylvania. There was no place for these. These people felt as though they had no place to turn to. Um, there are a lot of myths that develop out of the smog, and we can get into those. And of course, that will take a lot of time. And they appeared in things like Collier's Magazine, which was one of the leading, uh, you know, life Collier's and, and, and Saturday Evening Post. These are the staple magazines of post-World War II America. And no zinc worker, active zinc worker died in, in, in the smog. Do you, do you want to highlight a myth, Andy, or just want to move on? I'll do qu quick with Stanley Sawa. I was practicing uh, this. My, uh, my favorite myth. This yeah. is my favorite myth. Uh, Stan was a football player for Denora High School Dragons. And the myth is that he was called away from the game. They had a smog bowl. The game was Monongahela on a Saturday of the smog. And that he was called away from the game because his father was ill. And he got home and they said, no, no, I'm sorry, your dad died. 
not remotely true. Uh, Stanley played the entire game for the Dragons and, in fact, scored the final touchdown in the waning minutes of the fourth quarter. What had happened was his father had a stroke in 1945 that he got called home for from school. But he, the father lived two more years. He died in 1947, a year before the smog. Um, so that why that myth persists is that people apparently conflated those two events. And it's a great story to get called home from a game. Oh, no, I missed my father's death, but it's not remotely true. And there were others, of course, but yeah. It's, but it's such a good story, Andy. Why let, why let the truth get in the way? Good way. <laughs> um, and, and of course, we can talk about, I, I, over the years, I've interviewed a lot of people uh, from, who, who were at the football game, who were at the parade. And I can guarantee you that if we had 10 of them in this room, five of them would say they could see the game. Five of them would say right. they couldn't see the game. Uh, so, 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 so much for the eyewitness. Um, what put the zinc works out of business? This put the zinc works out of business, not the 1948 smog, but the imperial smelting process in 1950 came online just two years after. And the Belgian process was put out of business. And American Steel and Wire, United States Steel knew this. And so they stopped, they ceased production. They, they filled all of the orders that they had, but they ceased production and they shut down the zinc works. Now, remember when I said the zinc works was labor intensive? There were 8,000 jobs in that complex down there, 4,000 alone just in the zinc works. So you're not shutting down one department, you're shutting down half the mill. And of course, then they're just going to let the rest of the mill die. Um, and this is the aftermath. We have great uh, shots of them tearing down. Uh, we have uh, 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 eight millimeter film that people went down and, and when they were dropping the stacks and they just dropped them. So can you imagine the toxins that are coming out of those stacks after all of those years? And this is the video of it, but we're not going to be watching that. And then on the first Earth Day back in 1970 at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, they were giving away these buttons. We, we were lucky enough to get one from a young lady who brought it to us a couple of years ago and it's over there on display right now. But this is, um, Andy, I, I know this was one of your, <coughs> excuse me, slides. Do you want to talk about this? Yeah, this is, uh, this statistic is uh, from the latest um, air quality survey for the American Lung Association. They do, Association. They do one every year. And this, I thought, was uh, striking. There remains a great deal of uh, pollution, air pollution in the U.S. Much of it is ozone pollution, but there's a great deal of Particulate, particulate matter, particle pollution as well. Um, California leads the way with Alaska, the Mississippi River Valley uh, close behind. It, there's a, it just a, remains a great deal of air pollution. We have a great deal more work to do. And one in three of us, every other person you're sitting next to basically uh, lives in places with unhealthy levels of pollution, air pollution. I think everybody in this room accounts for all all of the one yeah. everybody in this room is living in, in, that, <laughs> in, in that danger so what are some of the results of the disaster we get some types of government um uh oversight agencies all of these different departments are going to start to come online and get in place but it's going to take a very long time the first legislation doesn't appear until 1955 and that has not, no no teeth the 61 legislation the 64 it's not until 1970 and richard nixon a republican president ironically that actually puts in the clean air and water act and then the 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 president that puts the teeth in the dep and the epa is 1990 and that's bush 1 who i call the good bush and uh so and so we, we get things like the environmental movement uh, and all of these different organizations that we're looking at recycling, we're looking at conservation, we're looking at sustainability, all of these things that are going to be important to us. And of course, we have to deal with... Uh, we have to deal with... Uh, 
now we have to deal with the challenges. And our greatest challenge right now, I, I believe, and I'm going to let Andy give, give, give his, his opinion, and we're going to kind of wrap this up and get to questions, um, is the anti-intellectual movement. Uh, there was a time in this country when I was proud to say that I was that I had a master's degree in American history. Now my education means nothing because anybody can have an opinion and refute that and, de and, and, and deny that. We're living in what a Isaac Asimov wrote, a cult of ignorance. We, we embrace ignorance for some reason. And I'm gonna stop there before I get out of control and my wife has to take me out of here in a straight jacket. Go no, Andy, I, it's your I, turn. I, I would, Start, I, try to stay. I, Absolutely agree with that. And there have been treatises written on the causes um, of what we're seeing now is this anti-science, anti-intellectual movement, anti-elite movement. Um, the science part particularly matters to me uh, and to everyone, really. It should because climate, the climate change has been going on for decades now. Um, we've known about it. The scientists have been telling us we've got to do something, we've got to do something, and it just hasn't helped. And we are seeing we're backtracking on many things now. Um, it's very hard to get legislation passed that really works for climate change. Uh, I hope that changes. Um, I hope this is just a phase that the nation is going through, that the world is going through. It's not just us. Um, I, I, I hope uh, it's a phase, and I hope the phase ends or at least lessens soon because we really need to um, get to the science of what's happening everywhere. Okay, hey, any final thoughts, Andy? Um, uh, how do I get back? Okay, great. I, I, I from from my point of view, um, I have been so impressed with uh, with Brian and Mark uh, and the Historical Society and whoever's involved with it, Dave Lonich. It's been wonderful to get to know them and to get to know this story it's an important story and i hope that uh people listen to its lessons and uh become active uh at least in their in their own communities to try to make some changes uh, uh to reduce air pollution and to affect the beneficial effects of climate change so uh i have i enjoyed writing the book very very much and i certainly have enjoyed being here with you tonight john i see you're ready I'll pass pass it back to you. <laughs> well, actually, before... and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Suzanne to uh, chair uh, and uh, raise the questions that may have come in from the chat. So, uh, Suzanne, why don't you um, come on board and uh, start with the questions? I will. Um, John, I'm going to ask Brian to come back to his seat so he may want to respond to some of these questions. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you both. This was really, really informative. I know it's difficult to pack a three hour presentation into the short amount of time we have tonight. So I appreciate your willingness to uh, trim it down so that we could consume it um, as fully as we can. I have a question here from Sharon Stern, who asked specifically, were the smokestacks shut down when the smog began to build up, or did they keep running the plant? And do you uh, want to go? Yes, yeah, sure. The, no, they, they kept going. They, those plants, these factories that made steel, the ovens were like 3,600 degrees, many of them. You just can't shut that down without massive failure uh cracking of the of the the tanks and and uh that you can't do that they did wind up what's called banking the furnaces on sunday um after really everything had passed and after they'd had enough protest um and after the usc lawyers had got involved they said well we can at least bank the furnaces and what that does is just turns them down stops adding fuel let them cool very slowly down didn't do anything because by sunday early sunday afternoon we had a rain and the wind came up and the fog dissipated so it was far too late by then but you never could have shut the furnaces off um suddenly it would never have worked it would have been very very dangerous in fact 
Next. I'll call you back. Well, I see one here. Were the people in emergency workers, medical staff of Denor aware of the inversion as a cause? Wondering how aware of the cause of this while they were in the thick of it. It's amazing. And this is one of the major questions I had for Brian and Mark. Why? Why did the people, re they didn't, it was like nothing to them until they heard, and this answers another question, Walter Winchell on his broadcast say, listen, people are dying in Denora. What's going on? And then relatives started calling into Denora and saying, oh, is everybody all right? That's when they became aware that something was going, going on. Before that, it was another very foggy, but another very foggy day. They played the football game on Saturday afternoon. They held the Halloween thanks uh, Halloween parade Friday night. What's the big deal? So uh, were they aware of an inversion? No, they were aware of fog. They have fog every fall, and this was just another one. Brian, I right. Don't know. yeah, right, and, and that's the thing that we've we, that that in rumor blue sky you'll hear everybody say it was just another smoggy day in Denora. We had no idea of the da level of danger. Yeah. What type of coverage, news coverage, about the event took place in other places in the country, if any? Well, all the news services picked it up. Um, UPI, which was around at the time, and AP, uh, they all picked it up, and they all ran stories that a number of people died. Uh, some of them listed the, the names that they knew of. Uh, it talked about the, uh, the smoke. Um, fairly short, and it was it was an event that happened to a town. Is what I say in the book. It was not an event that happened to people. It just happened in town. <clears throat> the most interesting bit about that was there was a writer named Bill Davison, who wound up being a Hollywood celebrity writer. He wrote an article for Collier's about the Belgian uh, smog. This was in 1930. And uh, 60 people died in that smog. And it was the same thing as happened in Denora. And he wrote an article about that. And he said, you know, it's a wonder that it's a miracle that hasn't happened here. That came out three days before the fog hit Denora. It was published on October 23rd. He wound up doing another one. And, and actually, that article was, was enormously helpful in preparation for, uh, for the book. But it's fascinating that the vast majority of articles that came out that went around the world were just small stories about this event. And a, and a bunch of people died. <clears throat> Brian. Right, right. Uh, we, we, we live in a world of instant news, and that wasn't the case. As a, as a historian, I would say that this is a great teaching moment, and I would need the next 20 minutes to, to conceptualize what the newspaper uh, was at the time, what radio was at the time. Uh, and of course, Life Magazine came here. That was, that was a huge, huge yes. event. Uh, to have Life Magazine, actually, uh, Alfred Eisenstadt was actually the photographer who came here. We have extra photographs that he he had left here with the Historical Society at the time uh, that, that he had taken. And we have wonderful photographs from um, Alfred Eisenstadt. So it's. That's so along along those same lines, the question was asked whether an event like this happened anywhere else in the U.S. We know Belgium, but did other such events happen in the yeah. We haven't had anything close like that in the in the U.S., although Denora had experienced a couple of times earlier in the century when there were temperature inversions and the people got sick, but there were no real statistics about that. Globally, the two main events, other than what's going on in China and India, especially New Delhi, horrendous. Um, uh, Belgium, uh, along the River Meuse, there was an event, as I mentioned before, 60 people killed. The London smog was probably the, the biggest one. And recent studies there that have come out in the last few years indicate that it wasn't 4,000, which it was for a long, long time. It was somewhere in the vicinity of eight to 12,000 and possibly more. It was an enormous uh, a problem. However, it was due to different things. In London, it was due to burning of what's called nutty slack which is a very cheap, cheap coal that releases lots and lots of toxins. And most people were burning coal stoves at the time. Uh, the factories ran on coal. 
So uh, it was a different reasons, but the same type of thing happened, a temperature inversion in the London Bowl, basically, geographically speaking. Um, I know you mentioned the doctor who told his patients right. to get out of town or go up on the hill. Right. Just for clarification, Stacia asked, "Were what? There was no evacuation order, correct?" No, I, no. nobody. No, there were no protocols for the, the, the. This is something that they're dealing with instantaneously. They're just coming up with ideas and trying to figure out what what can we do. There, there really is no one leading anything. So Philomena asks along those lines, did U.S. Steel know all along how dangerous the work was? Did they know and not care? And yeah. she was thinking particularly yes. about tobacco. They knew the truth all along and hid sure. it, denied it for decades. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. We have no proof. I mean, I I, I, I go to, to the source to try to get information and they deny that Denora even had a meal. So, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and you think about we just came out of World War Two and the zinc that had been produced in the Denora mills and some others, um, they they helped prevent rusting of rifles and tanks and helmets and you know, canteens, that, that's what zinc does. It galvanizes iron, and that's what GI stands for, galvanized iron. So the, these are enormously important factories uh, producing enormously important materials. And so, yeah, sure, they knew the danger of them, absolutely. Um, it's just like, yeah, it's, that's part of the deal. If you want to make America great, this is what has to happen. And uh, we don't think that way now. Well, about yeah. most things, we don't think that way now, but um, it was certainly a thinking then. They absolutely knew, sure. How far would one have had to travel to get out of the danger? I mean, obviously, you mentioned that going to the top of the hill was better than being in the bottom, but did this go into greater Pittsburgh, for example? Or well, you how couldn't far get out. The, uh, you the could... smog... <clears throat> yeah, it would have helped, but you couldn't get out. The roads were were impassable um, yeah, unless were you got out early. Were people in Pittsburgh or further up the river getting no. the the no. effect? No, no. The, 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 there were whenever uh, we were doing our research with uh, individuals and doing a lot of primary research with interviews, they talked about a curtain that uh, that was kind of like uh, uh, near Manesson and then near Monongahela, Monongahela on the north, Manesson on the south. And it was just kind of a wall. Remember, this is a temperature inversion. There's no movement of air. So everything is kind of staying right there. It has nowhere to the na na nearby neighboring communities. Interesting. Even if there um, had been a breeze, it would have to get hmm. around the river and then loop around. It would have blown it out. It wasn't like a straight river it wasn't that right. kind of containment the river itself and the the top topography of the area confined that event those that smoke mm -hmm. sorry go ahead uh, there was just uh, a question about really the the long-term effects and particularly with respect to neuropathy but even more broadly have any studies been done about long-term health effects based on not just that event, those few days, but there was, to work in that area. There was a 10-year uh, investigation in which they tried, the health service tried to uh, recreate the conditions in the valley. And of course, they, they couldn't. Um, it, it, the zinc works was pretty much done by then, its work, and they couldn't make a temperature inversion. So the report was essentially toothless. Um, it didn't really do anything. Even the first report, which had the greatest amount of uh, first-person accounts and, the, and a great deal of research and uh, scientific studies, that they sent out a preliminary report, but it was never followed up with a final report. Mm. It was pushed away. Now, that's, a, that's, that's good. We don't need any more of that. And I suspect it came from higher above 
the public health service, someone high up there said, "Nope, U.S. Steel just contact." I'm I'm guessing. I don't I don't know. Um, uh, but it's a guess. I think you're right, Andy, because you have to remember again, conceptualizing. United States Steel was one of the most powerful corporations in the world at the time. They are Google and Microsoft and Amazon combined. Uh, they they are yes. huge. <clears throat> yes. Uh, we have a question here from Bob Schmetzer, who would like to ask it directly. Bob, can you unmute and and uh, who would you, you like to direct? Can you hear me? To? Yes, absolutely. Oh, good. Hey, I'm uh, from Beaver County, and we have a very similar situation with the Shell Petrochemical Company that moved in over top of what was St. Joe Lead and Horsehead. Um, they filled in the land uh, with fresh soil so they could fill in the brownfield. But the mountainside was so full of mercury, it would squeeze up around your shoes. No vegetation grew from since the 1950s. You guys have really opened up uh, my eyes to a lot of stuff that I've seen growing up here in the valley. Uh, as you know, Shell just got fined $10 million. But to Shell... Uh, that's pittance when they make like three billion a, a month or something worldwide. Uh, history is repeating itself here in the Beaver Valley. Um, so everything you're saying happened is happening right now in the Beaver Valley, and uh, we're organizing and, and trying to fight this. You know, you still got the black smoke coming out of the smokestacks. Uh, which is a violation of federal law today, thanks to all of the fighting that happened over the years. But uh, your story, history, is so very important as a basis for us fighting to try to survive here in the sacrifice zone. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Indeed. Um, and Jack Broadbent said that he missed this point that I think you referenced before, but why U.S. Steel closed the plant permanently, ultimately? Oh, that because of the imperial smelting method. The method that we were using here, the Belgian method, what became obsolete when Imperial came online in 1950. The United States still couldn't compete. They made a business decision, got out of the zinc works, and the Z Denora existed really because of the zinc works. And so there was no more need, there was no need for the zinc work any longer. Uh, and so Denori is out. Okay. Thank you. Well, is there anyone else online who hasn't raised a hand who might want to ask a question? There's a, there's a question I from James that I, I, I can address very quickly. How many people died from the lingering effects after those inversion days? My grandfather uh, died November 18th, but was sick the whole time, but uncounted for obvious reasons. Um, the a, a great number of people died uh, from lingering effects. The, the deaths even after, immediately after the smog, uh, might not have been counted because he didn't go to the hospital. There wasn't information on him. Um, there's typically a 40 day period after pollution event where the epidemiologists count the number of people who died there, but they had to have been sick from the beginning and there had to have been some evidence there. So perhaps you know, the grandfather was missed. But in any case, yes, people continued to die. Stan Musial's father, um, Lukash uh, Musial, died after the smog, most likely from the effects of the smog, but he didn't die in the smog because it was past that 40 day period. And many, many people fall into that, um, that category. Okay. We need to wrap up, but Mel Packer has asked twice now. He, yes, loved, I see. he would like to understand why there were not similar effects in Pittsburgh while the mills were going like crazy in 1948. Not from the door, the North Smug, but inversion here. The inversion happened primarily because of the topography. Oh, Brian, you, you want to take it? No, I, yeah. I think the quickest answer, Andy, is no. They didn't have a zinc works. 
that is the that's the that's the whole point of this. It's the zinc works in Denora. M- Manesson had great mills. Yes, uh, it, it, going down Pittsburgh, Clareton, Duquesne, Homestead, uh, Rankin, uh, all all of J J and L. Uh, there, all of those mills kept on working, but they did not have a the zinc, zinc mill. The toxins coming out of the zinc works was the key. And then the, the Thank you. topography of that valley was perfect. Mm-hmm. A perfect storm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And our last question is going to go to June Waldman, who's on the Zoom, has raised her hand. Thank you. you. Yes. Well, I, I, am, I am most afraid now that we are, wor- there are some of our politicians and our parties are worshiping at the um, cult of ignorance, where they just don't believe science at all. And no matter what they can do to tear it down, they're going to do. Well, yeah. Yeah. Too Very. many. Too many. Yeah. Don't Very get scary. me started. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get Brian started. His wife okay. will have to take him out of the room. Well, okay. <laughs> um, Don't Brian- get me started either. Thank you. <laughs> Brian, um, if you don't mind, now switch seats with John here, and he's going to take us home, wrap it up. <clears throat> Uh, don't go too far, Brian, because I, I have a question about um, what was the population of um, Denora at the time of the smog? Uh, a little over 14,000. 14,000. Uh, Denora geographically is very, very small borough. Den- uh, Manesson, on the other hand, had a population uh, of well over 25,000. Uh, we could have had those types of numbers as well. But again, the geographic borders were too small. Every ethnicity that you want, you name one, we have everybody. There are a lot of Belgians in Charlotte, right? And you got a Belgian technology, but that wasn't an impact here. There weren't a lot of Belgians. I will say there weren't a lot of Belgians in Gilmore, but every, every, just about everything else. I'm sure there were a few. Yeah. Did the, did the population of Denora ever exceed that um, or survive or exceed the, uh, from the time of the smog? No, no, 14,000 was the peak in Denora. Today it's around four, less than four. 4,000. Um, so um, I, I want to thank very much uh, Mark and, and Brian and Andy. Uh, this is a, a sad story, but it's also um, an enlightening story that um, we can take and, and think about and try to act upon. Um, it's incumbent for all of us, particularly knowing that um, our world is um, careening towards uh, a, a situation where civilization may not survive. And um, it's time we feel that on that list of causes for why this happened, you have to put the stock market system of our country there as well. You have to put the kind of economy we have that values profits over human life. And we have to take that seriously enough to find another economy, a high road economy that takes into account that if we don't find clean jobs and actually challenge that market economy, uh, we're not going to survive. And, um, Our hope is is that by looking at our history, uh, we can also determine our future and find a way that we can meet what we need to do to at least mitigate the problems that we're every year making worse. So um, we can be advocates not for uh, not for closing down all businesses, nothing like that. 
but we can be advocates to look at a high road economy where when technology brings huge changes and the communities that benefited from the old technology face uh, an uncertain future, that we have a society that can put resources into supporting that community, creating those jobs and moving ahead on a high road where our communities are not abandoned, our technical workers are not uh, confined to the unemployment lines and our uh, people that are fragile in health are not confined to an earlier death than they would have. So it's a bigger picture, uh, but one that we all have to begin to try to talk about and understand. And um, our role, I believe, is to be truth tellers, to develop the data, uh, to uh, explain and talk and show the, uh, the information that can help folks. And uh, let's move forward together, build partnerships among each other to make it happen. So um, I wanna thank uh, again, the, uh, the Nora Smog Museum leadership. I wanna thank the people of the Nora that uh, have endured uh, here and uh, invite all of you uh, to join together. And um, let me just say that uh, perhaps uh, you already know through the, the, the Nora Museum, but it, if you decide that uh, you'd like to join the Battle of Homestead, uh, you can get a free card, a, a membership card with free admission for to you and a party of four to go to the Heinz History Center or the Western Pennsylvania Sports Museum, the Fort Pitt Museum and, and the Metacroft, Metacroft Rock Shelter and Historic Village. Our annual dues are $20, $10 for students and retirees. And um, please consider a tax deductible contribution to our organization. Check out our website, battleofhomestead.org to learn more. And of course, utilize the wonderful resources and website and artifacts that are here uh, in the Donora Smog Museum and other life museums and, <laughs> and uh, love a historian, okay? Do you <laughs> love a historian? So uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, we'll see you soon for our next event, uh, although it will not be until late October, early November. So um, take care, follow our website, and uh, see you again. Thank you so much, Andy. And um, we'll make sure University of Pittsburgh does its best to distribute your book. <laughs> thank you, John. Appreciate it. And uh, folks should check out the chat where uh, you can find out how to get Andy's book. So thank, thank you, John. Thank right. you all. Have a good rest of your night.